from the quantum optics group in the quantum measurement division at NIST. He's also a JQI affiliate. Uh, he did his bachelor's and master's at Moscow State University, then did his PhD at the uh, College of Optics uh, Creole at the University of Central Florida. I uh, did a postdoc with Jeff Kimball working on atomic ensembles and quantum optics, and then uh, came to NIST and JQI, and we tell us a lot about different types of quantum optical measurements. So turn this over to Sergey. Thank you. Thanks for this introduction, Kartik. It's good to be on the home turf. And uh, uh, so today I will tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been doing in the last about 10 years or so. So uh, those are quantum optical measurements of different kind. And I would try to argue that the only way you can actually have a fulfilling uh, optical quantum measurement is then you look at the fundamental physics of it and then also look at the other side of the spectrum, which is the applications. Now, this is the core team which basically give uh, uh, the materials uh, and do a lot of work to actually generate this, uh, uh, this results for us. And you mostly will be hearing about the results from this group right uh, this group right here. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, software update. All good. So should we just play yeah, close? Just close? Okay. All right. Very good. Um, yeah. So the new topic about which you probably don't hear so much from me anymore uh, at this point is uh, is uh, started with this guy and also with the remaining part of the core team. Uh, and uh, this is quantum internet where there's a lot of excitement, but not so many core results here. So uh, I will not be talking about quantum internet so much. I will just mention a little bit in passing. And this is this here is Alessandra Simonova who uh, uh, did some uh, uh, programming of movies for us that you will about to see in this presentation. All right, so uh, key collaborators come from all parts of NIST. We have co collaborators from ITL, uh, CTL, oops, uh, ITL, CTL, and MML, and obviously there are a lot of familiar faces from uh, the physical measurement laboratory as well. So we basically use all four research brands uh, or, or, or all four uh, uh, research branches of uh, uh, NIST here. Uh, we have uh, also some collaborators from Boulder. You have Seymour Nam and Ralph Jimenez who grew some biological samples for us. Uh, international collaboration is presented with the EPFL work that we had with Elena Gunt, who was at the EPFL at the time. And then uh, we have some joint grants with the University of Maryland professors on quantum communications, and I will cover some of that uh, in today's talk. So uh, I would like to argue that faint light actually is a kind of light on its own. And interestingly enough, there are fundamental properties that are very different for the faint light than it is for uh, normal light that we are accustomed to. And the reason is uh, that a lot of the time when you measure faint light, you, uh, you encounter a vacuum state. And with a vacuum state, the properties of that entire state that you get uh, are different from what you would expect. So I wouldn't call them quantum in the point uh, that you will get some kind of uh, um, entanglement or something like this, but there will be some weirdness nonetheless that you would not expect if you had only a classical picture of uh, uh, the nature there. And we will try to use it throughout the talk, by the way. So measurement is also kind of different. We count photons one at a time, which gives us an access to some extra information. Now, if that extra information is indeed extra for you and it's doing something better than a classical measurement would do, it's really up to you. You need to do something because typically if you just detect single photons, it's a quantum 1.0, it's just an intensity measurement. You need to do something extra in order to achieve those results here, uh, the uh, non-classical results. So naturally from fundamental properties and the properties of the measurement, you go to the applications and you try to see what can be done in the real world and in the real world a lot of the time you have the instances of fine light which actually happen quite naturally for instance in medicine a lot of the time the signal is very dim and you need to measure it and in some other cases you have well quantum information states they are dim by definition and then you have uh well, communications over long distances, then no matter how much signal you sent at the beginning, at the end of your channel, you're probably going to see next to nothing. Sergey. Yeah. Coming back to your previous slide, the things about always quantum, which you've tried to be careful in the way you've said it, but for those of us who sort of grew up with Mandel and, and Glauber, the, um, 
the, the typical story that we've been told and that we tell ourselves is that as long as the light is not quantum in the sense of you know violating certain conditions about what the Wigner function does or you know yada yada yada, then I can treat any problem by treating the matter quantum mechanically and the light classically. And you seem to be saying something different. Yes, and I think it will be clear from my talk uh, when the situation is different. So for the vacuum state, uh, the vacuum state by itself is very quantum. There is no classical analog to it. And the more vacuum state you have in your state, in your overall state, so you have a little bit of, uh, let's say, coherent state and then the vacuum. Because of that existence of the vacuum state, you will actually see something that is non-trivial. For instance, you have uh, two classical coherent states. They are orthogonal by definition if they, are, if they have different frequencies, right? Now, they are non-orthogonal in the quantum sense of that because all the vacuum states are, uh, are, are, are basically non-orthogonal. They are the same. For instance, this is just one of the examples why you would get something different from, from that. Okay, that sounds like... Maybe we shouldn't flavor this too much, but it sounds like something that's mathematically different. But would you predict a different result? I mean, I can see one example. I'm not going to get the lamb shift if I treat the electromagnetic field classically. At least I don't think. I, I will. I will show you in this talk how you can uh, surpass a short noise limit, for instance, using essentially the properties of vacuum. We can talk about. I didn't prepare this con uh, this, this this conversation in a, in a way to really show you that it is the vacuum. But you can have it in your mind, uh, back in the mind, that we can actually argue that the uh, advantage that we get actually goes back to the, the properties of that vacuum. Okay. But uh, yeah. So. The resolution to those things which would be a single photo detection, in which case you're kind of automatically not able to describe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 so yeah, I'm glad the discussion has started and I didn't show any results quite yet. <laughs> I think once we slid into the lamp, should uh, we slid a little far from the top? Okay, yeah, very good. So, uh, what do we measure? That's very important. Uh, we measure. Uh, single photons, and by single photons, you would mean that we are measuring the arrival times of these single photons. This is the information that is typically classically not available, uh, the arrival of discrete particles. And if you're clever, you might be able to use it to your advantage. And uh, also, you have an access to photon number statistics Then you do these kind of measurements. And again, this is something that you cannot access classically. You only deal with the average fields. And again, if you're clever, then you can somehow use this information in order to uh, uh, tell you more about the system. And I will first cover uh, this first topic, and then I will uh, switch to the number statistics. So the first part of the talk is really time de the detection of uh, single clicks. So in general, what you do here, it's a quantum measurement in optics problem. It's the most general problem that we are going to discuss here is that you have some kind of a, a input state, quantum or classical, and it has the duration T. And before you make a detection, the trick here is that you can do whatever you want within the physics limits, of course, any kind of transformation. And we are considering here unitary transforms. So uh, the transformed state will now have some different qualities, and then you do the photon detection. So uh, uh, the operator that describes this continuous measurement is shown here, and this is basically a bunch of time-dependent transformations to your input state plus detection of photons over here, basically a projection operator. And what we get as the result is this function z, which is uh, uh, basically the, uh, measurement record that contains clicks and times of those clicks on your detector and the transformation you have applied. So uh, a typical problem that people are interested in is you take a state, you know the measurement operator, and then you have an infinite number of outcomes because time is continuous and you can get a photon detection at any time. So you will be able to, uh, to prescribe some probabilities knowing this and that if this problem actually has a simple solution or you need a quantum computer to solve this, it really doesn't matter. But this is a typical quantum measurement. And uh, in this talk, we're not interested in it. We want to solve the reverse problem, which is called state identification. What it means is that we want to take a look 
at the final result, you know what kind of measurement you applied, but you didn't know anything about the state and you only have a certain number, limited number of identical states at the beginning. So by the only outcomes that are available to you, like this one, you need to guess somehow or make uh, some uh, conjecture about what the state was at the beginning. This is known as state identification problem. And this is a very quick example. Now, one state, just watch this phi two, can be responsible for this outcome or another outcome. Uh, but obviously the overall picture of which states could have been responsible for this outcome will be different each time. And you can use Bayesian properties uh, and again, quantum mechanics to calculate the probability estimate given that you only have one result. So it's one result that gives you some kind of an estimate. It is a Bayesian probability or confidence, and you don't really know at this point if it's if it has any roots in the real probability. So that's one of the things that we're interested in, what kind of probability this is. And uh, yeah, and that, uh, obviously the result is unpredictable and one state can be responsible for several results. So this is kind of a typical problem. It's a typical problem that has a lot of applications and that applications involve communications, for instance. So if you look back about 100 years back, then you'll see that signal to noise was on this axis here. So those are two different resources of communication. You need energy, you need bandwidth. People knew about bandwidth about 100 years ago that you needed. And then signal to noise was basically an artificial axis of energy. Uh, and uh, you you give you, you set the noise, you get the amount of signal that you need for reliable communication. And people thought about different communication schemes. So you would s set some kind of uh, different constellations of classical states, and you will try to state identify those states classically. These lines here are basically the uh, noise uh, uh, noise limited uh, noise limited uh, uh, boundaries for the intensities or, or or energies that you need to identify states. For what, what mode? Well, a mode is uh, in this particular case, it's just uh, uh, let's say a uh, Fourier, Fourier transform limited uh, band, uh, piece of bandwidth, but you could use a different mode like polarization to, tra to, to transfer uh, your state as well. So that also is a mode. Uh, I'm sorry, what? You could think about it that way, I think. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, that's very easy. The PSK would do it for you. So you change the, the, the phase of your signal, initial uh, initial signal, so you can have two or four or whatever, how many per mode. And, but that will require energy. That's the, that's the one point that is very, very, very important. That will require energy. So uh, quantum mechanics allows you to put these limits here in, in terms of actual physical quantities, the actual energies. And uh, this is because the noise, as we know right now, is limited by uh, short noise. And that short noise has a physical representation, basically. So another thing that you learn is that you cannot go forever uh, in these directions of preferential directions of having no bandwidth and no energy to transfer bits. And there is a hard bound, which is known as Oliver bound, that you cannot surpass in optical communications. So uh, let's do the state identification that pertains to uh, what we want to do with uh, uh, classical communications as well. So you have four different states encoded in phase. Uh, this is called phase shift keying for those who, who do uh, you know, that kind of technical work. You pick one and then during the time T, you try to do whatever necessary to measure that state. And hopefully by the end, you get the state that you'd like. Uh, but in reality, what you get is some kind of Bayesian probabilities of what the state might have been, and you need to uh, reason with this problem and see what this problem is really all about. So this is the experiment we did. It's a very, very rough sketch of what's going on. And obviously, on the, uh, uh, on the experimental table, much, much more going on. But what's important here is that you have a laser that generates both signal and signals can be in this particular example phase encoded, but we will talk about other encodings as well. And then you have a local oscillator that which can be controlled by your logics of your system. That's a FPGA here. And uh, this here is a quantum measurement that you apply to the incoming tasks. Uh, so this movie will show you really the algorithm with which we try to uh, actually beat short noise limit. And uh, 
basically that's your signal over here and from the bottom comes the reference beam which is a local oscillator so uh, this is a 99 to 1 uh, beam splitter so a lot of the signal from here passes there and if uh, the uh, reference is not matched the incoming beam here, then the output is going to be generated and you can detect it with single photon detector. But if the reference is exactly the same as the input, then there is no output and you can also see no clicks at the, uh, at the output. So we'll set up the problem like this. At the beginning of the measurement, uh, we really don't know which of the four states have been uh, sent. So you, you uh, apply one quarter of uh, the unity of probability to each of them and you start the time once you start at the time for as long as you don't have a detection your first guess which happens here to be a black wave uh, it's just a color coding uh, generates some signal you don't see it but the probabilities basically update constantly and uh, you there is no difference between the right and the wrong phase at first until the click arrives so before the click you had this uh, the, this hypothesis probability growing but once the click has arrived the probability is mixed up and now a different probability is the best possible probability so you change your local oscillator to match your next best guess and as you can see now the yellow starts to grow but again it's a wrong state you don't know about that until the click and once the click comes you need to again change your hypothesis and this time it just happens that you have the right guess at which point you generate no light, so no more clicks, and the probabilities still change until you measure the entirety of your signal. And at that point, you have this uh, probabilities which you really want to understand. For graphical purposes only, I will treat this uh, procedure as a color printer, and those are the CYK kind of colors that you get in the system. So what I really want to do is to take those colors and mix them up, as shown here, and put it on my graph for graphical representation that every single detection actually has some uncertainty in it. And this uncertainty you cannot control, but you know after you have made your measurement. Uh, so this is a recap, but because we'll use so much time, I will just skip that. So what are those probabilities? So those are the CYK kind of vectors. And uh, basically you would want them to be probabilities, but they in fact are Bayesian estimates. And they're made on one and only one measure. So you'd like them to actually correspond to the, to the actual probabilities, the frequency stock Kolmogorov type probabilities. And in fact, if you group those probabilities with high numbers and make a bin out of that and look at the statistical uh, success rate over here versus a statistical success rate over there, you see that there is a very close match to a line of basically Y equals to Z. So indeed, your Bayesian estimate made by a single shot actually corresponds to some kind of a physical reality if you will and i will say no more at this point uh because well the measurement you cannot control whatever the outcome comes it, it is what it comes but whatever actually is known after the measurement gives you a lot of the information about what the state was and may, maybe a little bit more than that so how can you use it well, the easiest way is to use it in a data receiver and just say, okay, the highest probability wins. And so we will just identify our state by the highest Bayesian probability. And a lot of people do that, and that already uh, breaks uh, some of those records of, uh, uh, of short noise limit. But, uh, and the, by the way, this is how it looks like. So uh, if you look at the fidelity just by eye on this, uh, of this picture transmittance, this is what we do in the lab. And this is a real working quantum enabled link here, as opposed to the ideal classical link, which we simulate because nobody can build one. And or basically you assume 100% detection efficiency and the only noise is the short noise of the measurement. And you already see the difference. We can do this in the lab and this is all, we only can do that in the computer. Okay, and indeed the, uh, the fidelity of our measurement is better than uh, what a classical measurement could, could do, so your eyes are not deceiving you, but at the same time, the, uh, 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 this fidelity behaves a bit differently uh, than the classical fidelity. You can see that classical fidelity is a little bit more monotonic, and here the uh, quantum fidelity jumps up again at the low fidelities so you would need to think about the methods of how to uh, uh, uh how to really use it for data transfer and if there are any ways to uh basically make uh the data transfer better with it so if you wanted to build 
a quantum error correct, well, not a quantum, quantum enabled error correction code, it turns out that this extra information, which is a physical information with Bayesian probabilities or confidences, does help. Because so this here is the raw data that we that we get, and uh, here uh, is a very simple and naive uh, coding for uh, data correction. So this is simply a repetition of the same symbol, and the repetition uh, method really helps. So you reduce the number of errors, the probability of errors, but you don't reduce it very fast. And by the way, you immediately you're above the classical limit here, which is the red line. Now. The only thing that is different in the between the upper graph and the lower graph, same resources for communication, but now you use the confidences and you do a weighted averages uh, as opposed to as opposed to just you know winner takes it all approach, which is this one, and you immediately get a better sir. Uh, signal uh, signal error rate, which is the goal, and you are below the uh, short noise limit already. But this result is actually not as good as, let's say, Becerra's result in 2013, uh, where he actually was able to measure better sensitivity, and this is his quantum curve here. But what we can do now with our quantum enabled uh, error correction codes is we can surpass this line and we can get here and we can have up to 40 dBs in the reduction of SER at about 10 photons per bit. And this is only possible because of the quantum enabled forward error correction. And uh, basically the only data set that we are using is this data set, which is a little bit better than short noise limit. So that's interesting. And what else uh, can you learn? First of all, where do you put that on this communication chart for communication resources? So this puts you here. This result is twice, it's twice better than, than what is possible classically. And this is actually done in the lab. So this is the result here. Uh, but you want to know, first of all, how well can you do? Well, with this particular coding, uh, you could actually have a sensitivity like here. But it's pretty hard to achieve in the lab. Uh, so we are not aspiring to get there. But there is another question. Can you get even closer to the Hollywood bound? And the answer is yes. And we did some research in this direction. So you can come up with the new schemes for classical encoding that would pack a little bit better in this space. But at the same time, they have a chance to be decoded by a quantum measure. And if your question is, can you do this kind of decoding classically? The answer is yes, but the uh, measurement will be different than your heterodyne or homodyne. It's going to be hard to make. And uh, so you would need a special receiver that is hard to make, uh, and that's why people don't do them. But for the quantum measurement, it's basically the same what kind of states uh, you're measuring. So we actually came up with the scheme, same schematic, and the only thing that we teach our FPGA, our logic, is that there are other, you know, packing algorithms for the classical states, and we teach that FPGA to distinguish between them then your uh, optical setup is exactly the same and you can test all the different uh, protocols with four states in your alphabet, with eight states in the alphabet, with 16 states in the alphabet, and happy to report that in all these cases, your uh, quantum measurement surpasses by error of uh, the uh, standard quantum limit, which uh, basically is a short noise limit here in for 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 uh, for this example. So you could ask a question, could you say it's better than like short noise, better than quantum? So what are exactly uh, compared to? Like what is the classical experiment? The classical experiment, experiment? yeah. So it, the yeah, the classical experiment is either heterodyne or homodyne uh, measurement, which is uh, which has the short noise because of the heterodyne and homodyne. So it's like a quantitative feedback, like don't that's right. I see. Yeah. Still the same thing, basically. Still well, uh, uh, yes, but the also detectors are classical, right? I see. Yeah. So there are no photons in a way. That's what they do, but you still, uh, but then you're going to get a short noise limit uh, digi it digitized. Help. It doesn't help. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so if you recognize the whole of a bound, so we can basically retrace whole of a bound with a little bit of, of the offset with our technology, with our different states. And that's basically a result of this work, if, if you want. And now if you simply combine the resource efficiencies, uh, and the, in, this cost function gives the same price to the bandwidth as it is for uh, the energy, then you'll see that our 
uh, states are actually indeed better. They are coming closer to the uh, to the whole of a bound than anybody else's. And we can actually demonstrate these results uh, in the laboratory as opposed to the classical results here. Now, if you would want to ask uh, me where you are right now, for those who are listening over the Internet, somebody is measuring faces on your on your behalf, by the way, because PSK is what people are, are working on. You are not even on this graph. You are at the, at the very zero here because the commercial state of the art is uh, magnitudes below what we can achieve now with this method. Uh, so uh, what were the red plots? On the uh, so this red is a short noise limit. And this red is 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 basically a short noise limit uh, discounted for our uh, system efficiency. But those lines are really just guides for the eye. So really, what exists are those points, and they're connected just to, 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 to see them in a more easy way. OK? OK. So uh, basically, if you wanted to do the quantum internet, then what's involved is a lot of classical data transmitted together with your quantum channels that it makes uh, for instance, you need to do information reconciliation uh, if you wanted to do, uh, let's say, uh, entanglement swapping or or teleportation. So it makes sense to combine quantum channels and classical channels, except that it's pretty hard to do because uh, a quantum bit versus a classical bit at the time of uh, being sent from the uh, uh, well uh, from the uh, from the sender really. Uh, is different by 10 to the 10 or ten, uh, up to 10 to the 12 in intensity. So it's really comparing the weight of a mosquito versus a uh, weight of 10 uh, blue whales. And you would need to somehow hide the 10 blue whales in your optical fiber so that the mosquito would feel nice in there. So uh, we tried to do that, and you can see it here that we keep our classical channels detuned by about 200 nanometers uh, to 1300. And about 100 classical channels can be placed in the, in the C band 1500s. And so if this is the configuration that you're running, then you can prove that uh, running classical channels together with quantum channels is not as easy. So the coexistence is not simply not feasible, no matter what you do after this red line. And in fact, to do this, you need to jump quite a lot of hoops. So this is like a speed of light kind of a limit. So typically, you would be way over here. But what you can really see from this graph is that the classical channel would need about, when the classical channel would need about one microwatt, your quantum channel can actually survive on 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 5 photons per second. And because of this change, you can drastically increase the maximal fiber lengths for, from about 100 kilometers to about 300 kilometers to still achieve coexistence. And for, for reference, this is the energy of a single photon per second. Probably you won't be able to run a classical uh, communication with just one, one photon per second at the receiver. <clears throat> but this basically tells you that if you're at that level, you only will be able to extend your, your communication length by another 100 kilometers, just one uh, fourth of the distance. So what goes into that, that, that calculation? Uh, this calculation is basically to see that the G2 of two independent single photon sources uh, would be below one half given that there is uh, some kind of a, a crosstalk because of the classical channels, because classical channels will generate uh, basically uh, noise because of the Raman activity. Oh, Raman. Yeah, I mean, this mm -hmm. is, in both directions. I simply don't have time to really talk about sure, it. Sure, but it, it's, it's a Raman limited. Uh... Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, mostly Raman limited. And, uh, and the problem here is that, that Raman activity happens in the forward and backward direction. And because the group losses are so different, even pulsing doesn't help that much because the pulses very soon become basically a continuous, continuous no, background. No model. Yes, there is a model behind it. It's going to be published very soon, uh, hopefully in Optics Express. So yeah, and we want to beat some other groups, and that's why it's an Optics Express publication. Uh, all right, so uh, coming to the second part of the talk, this is uh, uh, where we actually are interested in photon number distributions and as well as correlations between uh, the photon arrival times. So a little, you know, a, a different step, a little bit more that you can do with your system. And what can you actually achieve if you had 
this access to photon number resolution? And what could you do with, with some cross correlations between your photon detections? So it turns out that the statistics of different light sources are very, very different. And so by just monitoring the statistics, by being able to see when the photons arrive at your single photon detector, you can tell a single mode thermal source, such as a lamp, from a laser and tell both of them from a single photon source, for instance. You don't need to get inside uh, your source. You need, don't need any kind of physics. You simply look and count your photons, and that's enough. Uh, how do you count these photons in reality? Well, typically, and a lot of the times, just two detectors are enough. And the whole method is based on uh, the fact that a single photon state will only produce one click at a time, so there will be no coincidence after splitting that light on a beam splitter, whereas a multi-photon state might produce two clicks or a coincidence on the two detectors. So it turns out that if those are real coincidence, so the detection time T1 equals to detection time T2, then this correlation function really is a photon number statistic function. And you can extend this logic to a higher order to a third uh, G3, G4, and et cetera. It's a little bit uh, more difficult, but I'm not going to do it here. Uh, the other interesting thing here, which is also often overlooked, is that the definition and, uh, of G2 is actually this thing here. So now you have some creation and annihilation operators of, uh, of uh, the light field. And what's important is that these operators do not commute at different times in general. So what you need to do is you need to consider quantum dynamics in your source in order to be able to compute that formula. And what it means is that this very method counting of photons provides you the way to actually observe quantum dynamics without doing anything with your system. And this is one of the examples of that work. So uh, here we're looking at the physics behind quantum dot emission, or better to say emission of several uh, uh, single photons from a same quantum dot during the same excitation pulse. So you would think that a normal two level or three level system once excited will only give you one photon but unfortunately it's not the case for uh, for real life and and uh, for instance the single photon source that we study is embedded in uh, uh, some semiconductor and you can excite uh, carriers inside that semiconductor that can actually affect this process that's precisely what we see so what we're looking here as are the maps of g2 functions here uh, of the same quantum dot, but with different excitation uh, wavelengths. It's the same quantum dot, but it, it actually works differently. So it turns out that you can sometimes optically excite extra carriers, some fast carriers and some slow carriers in this case, only fast carriers in this case, and no extra carriers in this case. And you can actually see that on your uh, on your G2 maps, and then you can come up with a theory that backs up this uh, and see that indeed the repumping from the carriers can generate pictures like this, can generate pictures like this, and in this case is basically a flat, uh, flat G2. <clears throat> so basically what you saw here is because the first photon is, is uh, emitted very early in the cycle, the remaining carriers have, still have a chance to repopulate the excited state of your quantum dot and you will actually get another emission. That's why those lines here are so bright and almost indistinguishable from a uh, coherent state in terms of the statistics. It's not a coherent state, but the amount of content from uh, two photon uh, processes is pretty high. And that basically gradually goes down if the first, if the first count happened later in, this, in, in, in the cycle. All right, so here you're looking at the Another kind of experiment, I just told you that the statistics is going to be drastically different. And now what we want to do is we want to use a photon number resolving detector and try to guess what kind of a source we have, not just uh, what kind of a, a single type of a source, but we can combine up to four different sources here. And I'll tell you why four uh, in a second. And we want to run some kind of the statistical algorithms based on your uh, photon number distributions and restore or reconstruct the uh, structure of your known source. So this problem is actually 10 years in the making. We started with some very positive results in 2013, where we reconstructed our sources quite well. But now we can actually reconstruct them even better by not only looking at 
Uh, and, and, and the thing is that for this experiment, we only need we only need four detectors. Oh, I think that stopped working. Yeah. What do you mean? I'm sort of guessing what you mean by pseudo thermal source. It's like you've got a rotating. Yeah, ground, ground glass. glass yes. Things. Yes. It's just the easy way to make one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you might want to, I mean, it seems to me I probably don't want to put the, the beam through the center of the rotation. Right. Well, it's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, yeah. So over here, you only have four detectors, so you only have an access up to the uh, you know uh, this guy over here in the photon number distribution, and uh, still you are able to <clears throat> take the unknown source with a combination of up to four different sources, run our algorithm, and out gets a very close answer about what you're going to get. I'm not going to get into experimental details here, but one uh, thing that we started to do just now in 2022 is we started to look at the coincidence of undetected photons, and that actually uh, turned out to be quite interesting and allows to basically decouple the coherent source from all the other sources a little bit better. That allowed us to actually completely uh, forego guessing of which sources we need to start from. So you, you basically run through all the possibility of the uh, uh, combinations of sources and using our algorithm, you can basically find which one is responsible for a particular photon number distribution. And we, we, all, we can tr truncate it over here at four, which is quite an interesting result, I think. Now, uh, uh, you can go one step further if you have better detectors, and in this case, we did have better detectors. Those are TES number resolving detectors, and we were able to resolve more than 20 photons in a pulse. So here you're looking at uh, generating photons in pairs, so you have a pair, and uh, uh, because of that, the number of photons in one arm of this measurement is supposed to be the same as the number of uh, photons in the other ideally of course but once you have losses once you have some other effects that may happen inside your generating setup uh, you actually uh, may end up with uh, different distributions and those distributions were measured this this is the measure distribution right here now what you want to do with this problem is simply uh, this is what they teach you in the quantum optics class 101, I think, or just quantum mechanics. If you are not interested uh, in, interested in a quantity, you sum over it and you look at what's what's remaining. So you take this joint of uh, photon distribution, you sum over one of the uh, one of the detectors here, and you get the individual distribution with which you can do exactly the same as I showed you in the previous step. So uh, you identify all the modes in one of the uh, arms of this experiment, then you identify all the modes in the other one by simply counting photons again. And then you remember that you had the joint photon number distribution and you look for coincidences and you identify which modes were responsible for those coincidences and which modes were not. And this method particularly characterizes here a very, very bright source. So you generate about 10 photons, 9 to 10 photons in a single pulse. They are all identical because they belong to a single mode based on our experiment, and this was cross-verified with somebody else's work. So only those photons that are in the same in the same mode can uh, produce quantum interference that people desire, and uh, obviously that verifies that the source is, is, is quite good. And uh, here is something that you can uh, do on your, uh, on your smartphone if you'd like. We have this program uh, basically ported to a web portal, and you can look at, generate your own distribution uh, theoretically, or if you happen to have a TES, you can reconstruct your uh, your source all by yourself. And uh, that's not the only uh, tool that is available here. The G2 calculations are also available. Uh, and in fact, uh, we were, I think we were first to calculate G2 on a smartphone, which happened about a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> but now you can do so too. Um, so with this power that we can actually have uh, for, uh, well, different experiments and uh, learning about the system, uh, a quantum system without really touching it, you wonder if you can apply this knowledge gainfully in biology, because that's, again, a kind of uh, uh, natural source of faint light. A lot of the times quantum sources are there and nobody really uses its quantumness so far. So what we are interested in is actually looking at fluorescence here and uh, 
answer a question, are those only pretty pictures? So obviously this contains a lot of visual, visual information for doctors and everything, but those, those images are still quantitative. Uh, you, oh, sorry, quality and you want them to be quantitative. And uh, another thing is that a lot of the time you simply are not interested in the entire cell and you need to find one defect in a huge populations of cells. So can you use these fluorescent methods to detect something gainfully over a large population, uh, cells, uh, cell population? So uh, basically you're looking at the problem where you only have one biomarker or one quantum dot fluorophore or MP center inside a cell. And uh, the reason to do that is not only to calculate the number of them, right, and find their presence or absence, but also if you happen to use that kind of a, a single, photon uh, single photon source as a, uh, as a sensor, then you want to know that you're really looking at one and not ten because you might be only interested in the vicinity, the local vicinity of this particular sensor. So uh, finding a difference between many and one and none is quite important. And like I said, this problem may be uh, aggravated by the fact that you're looking at a large population of cells and only one of them is the one you're looking for. Is it a needle in a haystack problem or something else? Well, so this is a good, defini uh, well, the good definition of the problem and motivation for me. But if you ask people uh, on the biological side of the aisle, then uh, they're actually interested in some applications. And here are some applications that you can do if you had uh, really an access to a single fluorophore. Uh, and here, uh, one of the examples is gene editing verification. So if you people talk about personalized medicine quite a bit, so you take a patient, you take a sample, you uh, gene edit that sample, but what you, before you actually re-inject that same patient, you probably want to know how many uh, cells were edited as desired, how many uh, undesired cells there are and what actually remains unedited, in, unedited. And a lot of the times you're only looking at one edit per cell. So uh, as a large population, you need to assess quite a bit of the cells before you are sure. And so uh, in order to do that, you need to be able to detect single emitters and single emitters fast. Now over here is another example of where that can be uh, helpful. So let's say you have uh, uh, particular genes that are normal, but the overexpression of those genes is not normal. So you need to really quantify if there are normal amount of those uh, genes versus abnormal amount of these genes. So you really need to count. In this case, it's two versus six. It's very different than counting uh, 200 versus 600, because at this level, uh, the signal to noise may be actually quite bad. So you need a different tool, a second tool, in order to be able to count the emitters. And naturally, any quantum emitter, any single photon emitter, exhibits G2 of zero, as we just looked at. So there are no coincidences in detection. And you can actually scale this at the quantum scale. So for two, for, for two sources, this number is going to be one half. Uh, for free sources, this number is going to be 0 0.66, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this becomes another scale that you can access and you can make measurements. You're only counting photons after all. Uh, at the same time as you're taking classical intensity, so you can enhance your measurement, your classical measurement of the intensity that comes from a cell with a quantum measurement that gives you the uh, uh, absolute scale for how many emitters there are. Now, uh, we actually wanted to see that in the context of flow cytometer, so for fast detection, and uh, we built one at home. And uh, uh, if you're not uh, sure what a flow cytometer is, your blood actually has acquainted with it, I'm sure, pretty much, because uh, most of the people had some uh, blood work done. And a lot of the time, if the panel is a little bit more advanced than a basic one, your blood goes through a system like this, except that it's not quantum. So in our case, we are looking uh, at a very similar system. We run quantum dots through it, and uh, there is a, a couple of single photon detectors here, and we want to see if the correlations are indeed uh, non-classical. So before we see the correlations, this is the results that we typically get. 
and we didn't expect that. So from all the theory, the statistics of the uh, classical statistics of the uh, in instantaneous intensity should be Poisson-like. But in fact, what we see is that a lot of it is Poisson-like, but a very small fraction, but unfortunately a significant fraction, consists of rare, but very, very bright events that you can see on these graphs. And so the, the quantum properties of your signal depend very, very strongly on where you actually cut your set. So um, uh, at this point, we just made a hypothesis that everything that is Poisson-like in, in, in this picture probably behaves quantumly. And for simplicity, we, we said quantum particles produce G2 of, uh, of zero, period. No noise, no nothing. So it's a very overly simplistic model. Over here, it's a classical particle. So a classical particle will give you G2 of one. So turns out that if you now plot this G2 data as a function of the cutoff, of the intensity cutoff, you immediately get the numbers that are below unity for the low cutoffs, for low enough cutoffs. But what's really amazing is that this is the theory which has no fitting parameters other than the guess that I just told you about. And uh, uh, you see that the some features, uh, most of the features really, uh, that you see on these graphs are, are repeated by the theory. And yes, there is an offset, but we started from an unrealistic assumption that the G2 of the quantum signal is exactly zero, very signal to noise. So by just looking at this data and analyzing it, you can see that the uh, signal to noise ratio is definitely better than six. And this is a signal to noise ratio related to a single fluorophore not multiple fluorophores. And the signal uh, to noise ratio of six is actually quite good for many different uh, types of analysis. I'm not going to get into this, but uh, uh, this number is actually quite, uh, quite good for the populations, uh, for larger populations as opposed to smaller populations. Okay, uh, so to uh, draw this talk to the end, this is basically uh, the question of life, uh, universe, and everything, if you'd like. Uh, looking at the bio bioluminescence, is, bio is, is bioluminescence quantum? So people are acquainted with uh, fireflies for longer than they are uh, acquainted to fire. And uh, only in 1870, people actually uh, appreciated the difference, at least if you, if you believe this guy who published this paper, then that's actually the entire paper. So uh, this person observed the firefly uh, in the natural habitat, and they saw that uh, the light is cold, as described by this paper. And that means, they say, that the energy ex uh, extended in the fire uh, firefly is not wasted, basically. So a lot, most of this energy is light, and almost nothing is thermal, which was very odd because uh, other artificial methods of illuminations are different. They're heat-like in the 19th century. So the person is really puzzled. We are not puzzled anymore because we know that it's a chemical bond and the chemical bond has more or less a given quantum of energy. So some of that process is quantum, but how quantum is quantum really? So let's take a look at what happens really behind generating the uh, uh, photons in this case. So the reaction really is, oh, is it going? No, no, come on. Oh no, really? Oh. I don't think this movie is accessible. I'm sorry, we'll have to believe it. Okay, so what happens here really? Yeah, that's that's a lot of things. So, well, anyway, so what happens is uh, you have a typical uh, problem here with enzymes and substrates, and uh, so uh, this is actually a catalyst kind of a problem. So what happens is there is a molecule called uh, uh, luciferin that can oxidize and release a photon, but it only can do so in the vicinity of the enzyme. But that enzyme has to be really, really close and in a very particular location with respect to the uh, uh, with respect to uh, your uh, substrate. So one enzyme can only oxidize one substrate at a time, which means that it is not the substrate but the enzyme which looks and behaves like a single photon source. And if 
you're looking at this and you're really puzzled this is because this, is, this, this picture is done by enzymologists who are interested in the kinetics of this reaction. So this is how they write them. So for us, the physicists, I made a different interpretation of this, and it actually is. So what you're looking at are, are quasi levels, They're not real levels, but so this is a state of the enzyme that is not um, excited with the substrate, if you'd like. And this is the enzyme substrate uh, formation over here that happens, and sometimes this dissolves. And then you have uh, the reaction, so the catalyst reaction, which emits the photon. Now, if you emit the photon, you will produce the oxidized material, which is the product here. And then you go down uh, by losing that, that product uh, and the enzyme becomes uh, unexcited again. So what's interesting here, as in any three-level system, a real three-level system, an emission of a photon from the radiative decay gives you the information about where your system is going to be at that point in time. So by knowing that the, the, there is a photon, by detecting this photon, you know that you're here. your probability of being on this level here, on the level, is equal to unity. Now, uh, it will take some time for the system to relax to its normal state and basically get back to the situation where can it emit again. So you should see single photons coming out and then some gap and then another single photon at some point in time. So to measure that, you will actually need to use some very, very special detectors. And we got some of those detectors from the Sevunam group uh, in Boulder. But we enhanced those uh, detectors. Those are very good detectors of nearly zero background, but you still have cosmic rays and all kinds of different stuff. So we came up with methods how to decrease the measured dark count rate in the measurement. So it's not like everything is blocked. You're uh, actually actively making a measurement to this number per second. And if you have trouble uh, multiplying, I can do the multiplication for you. This is about 10 photons. Uh, extra photons or dark photons per hour, 10 photons per hour. And only if you have a detector like this and the method to analyze the detector, as we show, the, only then you can actually have enough, uh, a, a good background to see this reaction. Now, uh, what we're looking at is this molecule. This is a sort of uh, 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 luciferin. It's called differently because it's a little bit of a different reaction, but the idea is the same. So nanoloop is your enzyme. This is your substrate. So what happens is that once one molecule like this finds a nanoloop, then uh, you basically generate uh, the oxidized uh, substrate and a single photon. That's the same as before. This is your three level scheme, if you'd like. And what we measure is the measure that G2s are indeed below, below, below unity, which is the goal of this experiment. But also, you can fit this graph here in a way that uh, it gives you the characteristic time of uh, coming to the statistical uh, balance between these states here. Uh, well, uh, from, from the time when it's everything is certain, you're in here, to uh, when everything is distributed uh, as, as, it's, as it should in steady state. So this time is about 20, say, 27 microseconds. And that basically uh, is something that nobody has seen because, well, nobody actually can analyze the light emitting enzymes one by one. So the, that. What temperature was this process? Room temperature. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a living, well, not a really living thing, but it's it's an enzymatic process. And enzymatic processes happen in your body all the time. So uh, I'd like to conclude. We didn't see the movie, but that's fine. Um, your body's not quite at room temperature. Well, <laughs> ah, it's within ten percent. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just wanted to finish with what I started that uh, um, faint light is quite interesting in its own right. There are some interesting fundamental properties which we want to study, but fundamental properties pertain also to the emitters, uh, classical, non classical emitters, and so on. Uh, there are some opportunities for a different measurement, and some measurements can be, in fact, enhanced with respect to the classical counterparts. And together, you can come up with some nifty applications. But in the end, once you look at the applications, you still go back to the drawing board and look at the fundamental properties as we did. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your kind attention, and sorry for not showing you the last movie. <laughs> Thank you.
What did the last movie show? <laughs> I can show it to you later. <laughs> but basically, it's it's really uh, it gives you a depiction of an enzyme and a substrate, and that the enzyme has a special uh, place where the substrate would go, and thereby it will basically take a very certain position in the uh, in the enzyme. It's a molecular dynamics. Basically, yes, and by, by by virtue of that, there is no other substrate molecule that can occupy exactly the same spot, which is the reason for single photonness photon of this process. Yeah. And um, one question about the first response. Okay. Uh, ridiculously about the role that the adaptability of the measurements plays. So you sort of giving yourself two things that the classical protocols that you're comparing yourself against don't have. Right? The one is the quantum detector, mm -hmm. and the other one is the ability to do adaptive measurements. Correct. Understand? And so my question is what happens if you take away the ability to do adaptive measurements again. So how do you compare it against the situation in, for example, take your measuring time, cut it up into four equal blocks, and then just put each of your four measurement sessions for that time, put that in like a patient analysis, and then make a decision on what you think. Yeah, very good question. People did that before. It works, and you can be non-classical if you'd like, but uh, the results are inferior to ours. Okay. And uh, so, by by quite oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah. So I didn't show it in this talk, but uh, yeah, where is it? Ah, yeah. I, I think I ha I have one point for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, here didn't speak about this. So this is the result at this particular energy, which was prior result from another group. It's right there. We can measure here. It's that that little dot here. This is from another group. That yeah, that green dot. Yeah. So in fact, they actually go slightly uh, below the short noise limit at some point, but all, ever so slightly. So at at one photon per bit they don't, but at I think one and a half or something like two photons per bit they do. And so, but but here the comparison is really to show that we are doing it at one photon. But, but yeah, so you can compare these results. And if you, if you look at our papers, and they're right here, then we actually compare everything to the prior results. Yeah. Um, how does that relate to the So OK, so you've convinced me now that adaptability, adaptability gives you an advantage. How does that advantage scale with the size of the code space? It doesn't scale very well in the end. That's what I think. Yes, you're uh, you're absolutely right. And there, but the good news about this is actually this, this this is really yeah. So it turns out, and again, I didn't show this due to the lack of time. That the only uh, the only quantum advantage that you really get is around here because this graph here is is exponential in this direction and in this direction. So uh, it is around this turning point where you can actually have the maximal quantum advantage for from any protocol. And that's where the number of uh, states in your uh, in your alphabet are going to be smaller rather than larger, or at least that's what I think uh, at this time. So for all these protocols, this is m equals to two, four, uh, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. Well, I give you a different right? If you imagine if you increase the number of states, like your protocol is basically asking, you know, formalized in a patient sense, but basically what happens. Hey, are you this state? No, okay, out. Are you this state? No, okay, out. Right? And so as you increase the number of states, that's going to be exponentially more expensive to do. Yes, so this algorithm, this particular algorithm will have problems. But if you had a quantum computer and if you did the uh, the projection correctly using a quantum computer, and there is an algorithm how to do that, you can actually uh, get get a good scale, you can actually be on this curve. So with our method, you will never be on this curve. This is um, uh, this is the Hellstrom limit. To be here, to be here, you need a, a, a projection. 
and you know the optimal projection. There is a theory of that. I think Guha has published a lot about this. But you need an access to an optical quantum computer. We don't have one, so we are we, yeah. Uh, I would say you'd better ask him what you need exactly. But it's, it's so there is an algorithm published there where you can do the. Uh, uh, in the most advantageous projection, state projection. Yeah. So following up on the previous uh, question, the um, the adaptive measurement is the main thing. But there is a little bit of advantage to be gained by simply doing quantum detection, if I've understood your answer correctly. But most of what you see as the advantage is the adaptive measurement. So that didn't surprise me at all, because I figured the adaptive measurement is what makes the light not classical, uh, that, that you have to do something nonlinear to the light, uh, and that's clearly uh -huh. a very nonlinear thing, what, what this adaptive uh, uh, measurement does. But I'm still a bit surprised that just the quantum detection gives you uh, something a little bit better than, uh, uh, than classical. And uh, I'm wondering whether there is a, um, whether you have a way of understanding that in the light of my sort of uh, uh, Mandel, Flower way of thinking about things. <laughs> right. So I think these methods actually target what's important in the measurement, if you will, versus what's not important. And uh, for instance, you know, giving another classical example of relay uh, curse. Right. Uh, so the the issue here is that uh, is that if you image an object, then yeah. Uh, you can't really resolve the two points be beyond some uh, some limit, right? But this is uh, for the universal kind of the imaging, right? So you could actually focus if you wanted to just know about the resolution of these of these two points. You could do a certain manipulation of your field, but then you will not really everything else will be obscured. But you will see and the result if there are two points in there or just one. So you in by by making the unitary transformation, yeah. Classical. Uh, unitary transformations, yeah, I guess they are classical, you know, in, in that way, yes. But for us, in order to reduce the noise to uh, below, be, uh, below the short noise limit, you require to actually measure uh, vacuums. Once you get to the vacuum, square root of vacuum is equal to zero. Okay, so square root of n, n equals to zero. So your short noise is equal to zero. So if you can put yourself in a situation when you measure zero, then your short noise is 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 no longer a problem. You can think about it this way for us. I think that uh, along those lines, that when you're measuring vacuum with a quantum detector, the detector is never going to click. Yeah, that's exactly classically zero. You, you could still get a click. And that too, but uh, I don't think this is. Uh, no, if you if you really put yourself in the situation and you measure nothing, and nothing is what you get. Well, if you don't classically, I don't know. Classically, if you don't put anything into a, a detector, you don't get anything out. I mean, you're saying that that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not sure what a classical detector is because what, what I'm interested in here is what the light is. Is the light does the light have to be quantum in order to get this? What you're saying, no, as long as the detector is quantum, I can see something that's non-classical about the light. That's right. Um, now, there's a natural let's, let's talk later. OK, <laughs> OK, all right, Nobody sure. wants yeah. to hear this discussion, <laughs> except maybe Alexi. <laughs> I wrote all these questions I'm going to ask them later. <laughs> Same question. OK, so you and I will beat them up later, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, very good. Very good. Very good. All right. Yeah.